So I'm standing there, staring at this TV that's right above the entrance to the restrooms. And I realized there's then this guy yelling at me from right below the TV, yelling at me, wondering why, why the hell are you staring at me? What are you looking at? You want to go outside? Oh boy. What are you looking at? And you're just and, and once mean I, mugging him the whole time. <laughs> yeah. And I'm, I'm just like, <laughs> but I'm looking at the TV and, and so then like somehow he caught my attention. And so my eyes just move ever so slightly down and there's this like five foot four guy yelling at me. And I'm like, what? I'm not. I'm looking at the TV. He goes, oh, sorry, man. You want to do some coke? <laughs> uh, yes. Welcome to the Video Reformation Podcast. I'm Ben Oliver. I'm Justin Plant. We're the co-founders of Storyboard Media and your guides to practicing effective video for business. We're like the Giles to your Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Giles. I never got into that show. Neither too, did I. Too, too scary. I mean... All those demons and stuff. Yeah, yeah. That was. I did like the movie though. Yeah. Well, uh, a, a lot of people have made comparisons to this show and and uh, Buffy, just like how addicting it is and and sometimes scary. Right. And I've always been told that I look like Sarah Michelle Gellar. Yes. So a, a '90s Sarah Michelle Gellar. Yes. <clears throat> yes. A mid to late '90s Sarah Michelle Gellar. Back in her prime. Um. Well, thank you. Mm-hmm. I don't know that we know exactly how to verbalize our topic yet today. I imagine this is one of those where we'll figure out the name of the episode during the episode. The best I can put it so far is differences in the types of content at varying stages of the marketing funnel. Mm -hmm. Quantity, quality, price, etc. It'll come to us. <laughs> yep. All five bullet points here are under each section. Um, but you're going to have to wait to find out what those are, because uh, as I understand it, we have a new sponsor this week. Sure do. Surprise. <laughs> wow. Um, who do we got today? It is Whipper Capper. Whip, whipper Capper? Whipper Capper. Wh whipper Capper. Uh, you can, uh, that doesn't have like a little pronunciation key, but I think it's either or. Whipper Capper. Heard it both ways. Okay. Well, stick around a little bit later, and you can hear the full spot from Whipper Capper. How do you want to launch into this one? I don't know. Um, like multiple conjoined triangles of success. I think I think we may actually need a graphic guide for this. Which we're also going to concoct on the way down. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'm now committing us to a graphic element to this episode. So. Yeah. For those of you listening the audio version, you may want to flip over to the video version. One, to see my flip face reminiscent this. of an in her prime Sarah Michelle Geller from the late 90s. Uh, and two, maybe just to see some of our multiply conjoined triangles of success. So we're going to talk about the differences in types of videos, production quality, quantity of content, the value of the content, metrics that you would track, ROI that you could track at three distinctly different stages of the marketing or marketing and sales funnel. I think we could probably just say that this is restricted to the marketing funnel. Okay, I was going to say we should clarify how that works. Yeah. Um, so I, to me, this would be up to a sale. Up, S well, yeah, up to a qualified lead. I think to the sale, I think is, uh, honestly, I think it depends on the company and how they're structured. Sure, um, I've, I, more and more, I'm having conversations with marketing departments and how they are needing to. Uh, sales teams are insisting that they get video content to help facilitate right. the sale, and so I would I would put it all the way through to the sale. I'm fine with that. Okay, agreed. So there we go, pre-sale funnel. Um, I don't think we need to worry about naming the stages of the funnel because then we'll get into a whole other conversation about all of the different terminology yeah. that surrounds everyone's got their own names for um, it, but. but i think we can all agree that the top of the funnel content is that brand and product awareness type stuff thought leadership um the middle of the funnel is that um kind of self-education consideration research what does this thing actually do couldn't help me mm -hmm. and then that bottom stage of the funnel is Okay, I see them as an option. I also maybe have a couple other options, and I'm making my final decision on yeah. whether to go with this. The decision making yeah. point. Yeah. So let's start at the very top of the funnel. Um, I think before 
and this is something that we've started doing in, in springboards. We've done before where we put basically pre-awareness content as its own level, and then we define awareness as awareness of the brand. But I'm, I've been starting to fold that all into just the awareness level. Okay. So it's everything from the first time somebody finds out about you, either through a piece of content or... That, that you've created or... or or an article that someone else, a third party article that someone else referenced you, mm -hmm. or they just do a Google search and end up on your site because you hit the same keywords that they were searching for. Yeah. Kind of all the way through, okay, now I see that this is a brand and they have something that could potentially help me. Yeah. At that point, you have gained awareness of this brand as a potential solution for you. Uh oh, <laughs> Justin's up. Track him. Track him. This Follow him. <laughs> This book actually has, I'm going to flip this open while you talk about it. I think er early on it kind of talks about some of these moments. Um, show us the book. It's Making the Complex Compelling by David Chapin. Chapin. I think Chapin. By our friend David. Once, um, once upon a time. <laughs> our once upon a time friend uh, David. So I've started basically positioning in our springboards awareness as that may have no understanding of who you are as a brand or a product through the the point where now they say okay these people might be able to help me with my problem even if it's not product specific what does the book say um this is based off of prochaska's trans theoretical model of change which everyone's heard of of course we've referenced um, it before in the podcast but there's pre-contemplation which i think <clears throat> is akin to I didn't know this brand or this solution existed. I didn't even know that I maybe even had this problem. Right. Then there's contemplation where you start to admit that the problem exists. You seek more information. Uh, then there's preparation where you're evaluating things. You're actively making plans, schedules, goals, trying to map out, you know, how am I going to buy something to solve this problem? Or how am I going to solve this problem? And then action, it's where you uh, assign resources to this solution. And then the sale, where you actually sign a contract or, or make a commitment to, to actually do something. And then it's got advocacy and stuff after that. Mm -hmm. But I think right now we're ending at sale. And as somebody recently said uh, somewhere, that awareness isn't this like aha moment. Nobody wakes up in the morning saying, you know what? I am now aware of the fact that I need a Martech solution yeah, for my yeah. whatever. Like, that's not how this happens. And I think that's you lost your little bookmark there. <laughs> Dry leaf. Because I think there is, and I know that thought leadership is one of those buzzwords that a lot of people just kind of zone out on, which is unfortunate because, and this is something that we have followed for years, but, but being an expertise based business um, puts you in a position to differentiate yourselves immediately from your competitors mm -hmm. who are maybe trying to commoditize something yep. or um, you know make it as scalable as quickly as possible they can so, so they can sell as much of it oftentimes uh, in the b2b game it's about specific solutions even if they are technological solutions SaaS solutions a lot of them are highly customized to the individual purchasers yep um, and so you need to build that trust before any sales engineer or even SDR starts to have a conversation with yeah. someone. And so there's this whole range, this whole opportunity to position yourself as someone who knows what they're talking about the space. And I mean, let's be honest, this is why the intro to this podcast is we're your guides mm -hmm. to practicing effective video for business. We've taken the expertise model here. We're trying to share our experience, our expertise, our, our positions on things. Yes, that's an important part. I was gonna say you hit at this part of the marketing world <clears throat> where you're helping somebody achieve awareness of a, of a problem you need to take a position. You need to have yeah. a perspective that set, that's part of your niche. Yeah. And we've talked about this even in recent episodes. Um, it's the companies that, that don't know how they're positioning themselves and they don't know what their tip of the spear is. They mm -hmm. don't know what their primary differentiator is, however they want to position it. it. Those are the ones who are trying to do like the one video that rules them all. Yeah. Right. The messaging to everybody because they haven't yes. taken the time and the effort. I mean, we're going on a very 
Um, no, this is perfect. This, I think it does apply yeah. perfectly. Um, but we're going on a very win without pitching yeah. tangent here, um, which is designed for creative agencies. But we found that it applies so often, even to B2B SaaS companies, mm -hmm. um, in these kinds of things. So back to the top of the funnel. We've got, um, we've got opportunities for lightly or almost completely unbranded content here because yeah. it's educational. We've got opportunities to start to create uh, a definition for the public of what the brand is about. Mm -hmm. um, and the brand, whether it's a brand that has 20 products, 2,000 products, or one software product, it, it needs to leverage that brand identity um, to try to sell the things that it tries to sell. Yep. So, so we've got this, this very broad audience, uh, search engine driven, um, educational help the audience, whether they're legitimate prospects or not, understand things about trying to figure out what their pain points are mm -hmm. or trying to name their pain points, right. trying to figure out what the problem is. Um, understanding those things before even saying, here's a solution. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't exactly explain a potential solution perfectly, uh, somebody without taking the time to do that pre-consideration stage, that top of the awareness stage, may not be able to connect it to a problem or a use case that they have that they yeah. haven't been able to define yet. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> to kind of draw that out in a different way, more of like a consumer world, uh, you might be searching for bread because you want to buy some bread online, which <laughs> everybody, everybody does these days, I guess. As an alter a bread alternative, you might jump into that search world and start to promote yourself there and say, did you know there's another thing out there that's maybe not as filling? Or you mean like lettuce wraps? Lettuce wraps, sure. I was, yeah, I was thinking, you know, gluten-free or, you know, certain allergens are, mm -hmm. you, you know, um, but a lot of the people who have just been eating bread their whole life didn't realize that, oh, there's lettuce wraps out there that are a lot healthier and less filling and, and so on. There's our title, by the way. This episode is going to be called Lettuce Wraps. Lettuce Wraps. <laughs> Let us rap <laughs> about marketing about videos. About video at differing stages of the funnel. So what type of content are we seeing in this pre-awareness uh, and, and awareness stages? I think from a messaging standpoint, it's largely very broad. So you may be creating a an educational series that answers just some industry level questions. Okay. Um, Do we need to have a product that we're selling? Is that would that help? We don't. <clears throat> okay. I, I really think we don't. I, I don't think we need a product until either the very end of this stage. To me, I didn't mean highlighting a product. I just thought maybe if we had a. Oh, like Pretend. a hypothetical Yeah, product. yeah. Um, lettuce wraps? <laughs> Let's go with it. We're, we're, we're going hard into the niche of B2B lettuce wraps <laughs> in this episode. Um, <laughs> Until that doesn't work anymore and then we'll abandon it immediately. Right. I give it three minutes. <laughs> I'm going to go search for um, alternatives to bread. Okay. And if, if your company... Um, let us wrap LLC mm -hmm. um, comes up high in my search terms with a video that says um, looking to quit bread try lettuce wraps mm -hmm. I'm probably going to click on that video and be like oh well I'm looking to quit bread let's see what lettuce wraps are about and what would what would you what would that video have in it do you think that video would probably spend half of its time or two-thirds of its time talking about the various reasons that people might want to quit bread. Mm -hmm. um, and one of those is going to be the reason that I want to quit bread. Maybe my reason is uh, I'm pre-diabetic and I want to cut carbs. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love sandwiches, and so I've got to figure out a, a way to cut down on like refined flours mm -hmm. and, and things like that to, to minimize my carbs. That would probably be one of the things that would be in that video, but some people may have developed a gluten intolerance, mm -hmm. and so they don't really care about the carb level. They care more, care more about the gluten. Give the people those opportunities to say, okay, well, these people identify the reason that I'm trying to quit bread as 
a legitimate reason to quit bread. Mm -hmm. I wonder if what else they have to say. Mm -hmm. And you could start to position lettuce wraps, or you don't even get into lettuce yeah. wraps at that point at all. I was, certainly yeah. wouldn't get into your lettuce wraps sure. at that yep. point. You may talk about, like, vegetable-based alternatives, mm -hmm. like two slices of tomato. Yeah. I'm hungry now. A potentially valuable piece of content in this scenario would be, here's the history of bread and where it started yep. and how we got to where we are and, and then identify like some issues with today's bread as opposed to maybe what we were used yep. to be eating. And so that, well, today's bread isn't really, you know, co um, doesn't really work in with today's modern person. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a mismatch there and just identifying that there's a, there's a mismatch, there's a, uh, a market opportunity or, I guess that's maybe the wrong way to put it, but there is a market opportunity in that. And would you like to know more about some alternatives? That's the kind of, if I were on that exploratory journey, I would want to, and, and I specifically mean I, but I think, I think what we know from a lot of the recent studies is that most B2B lettuce wrap buyers are self-educating before they say, I'd like to talk to someone in sales, sure. right? So I think it's somewhere between 83 and 87%. Like they make 83 to 87 percent of their their research, and they get that close to making a decision before they say yes, I'm willing to talk to a person who's going to try to sell me something. Yeah. So I personally would want to like I dive into that stuff. Yeah. And and I've always been like that. Even when I was a kid, like buying my first drum set, I was on the phone with music stores, like mapping out on a legal pad each piece of before hardware, video marketing cost, existed. Whatever. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Because yeah. I'm old. But like I've always been a very research influenced buyer, and I think what we understand about B two B buyers on the whole is that they are very re uh, research mm -hmm. driven, um, and a key part of that, yes, is why might somebody right? They, they may think there's got to be a better way. We we're we're exploring some client portals right mm -hmm. now, some digital portals, web based portals, to congregate all of our like weekly updates to clients and assets uh, assets d links to deliverables brand um, guidelines links to different um rounds of feedback all in one place so because so often and and you're this way when you're the when you're the client also right so so we would almost People are terrible at searching their email inbox to go back and find their it, it's emails are inefficient. Just to slack. Yeah. yeah, it's easier just to slack your client contact and say or vendor contact and say, "Hey, where's that? Where are these files again?" And when you when like when you get that the third or fourth time, it's like there's got to be a better way. Yeah, to share. This Everybody's stuff. thinking that. And I don't even know that we had we knew that we had a problem or that there were already pre-made solutions for those kinds of things. Yeah. It's just when we realized that we we're like, what if there was a thing where we could just compile all that stuff and like give our clients a login to yeah. access that stuff and like started Googling that. Like we didn't go and start Googling, Googling like client portal. It was like agency client management, client software. management tools yeah. or plugins or something like that. And then, you know, so we did that research along the way and then ultimately found two vendors that we have then had demos from and now we're trialing one mm -hmm. of those products but it all started two or three months ago with you know for the fourth time a client's like hey can i get a link to this thing mm -hmm. and you're basically just forwarding the link or the the email where you said yeah. here's the link again i sent this to you originally three weeks ago and you're doing that kind of passive aggressive yeah. like this you is are fourth time you yeah jack <laughs> um but what does this content maybe look like in terms of tone, production quality? I know some of it depends on your brand. It does, of course. But but you can't just um, you can't just say really smart things in a boring and monotone way that isn't engaging because you're not going to get through uh, because there's so much competing for everyone's attention that someone else is talking about uh, how to quit bread. And if they're doing it in a more engaging and interesting way, mm -hmm. I'm not going to give the boring and bland 
uh, delivery of it much of a chance because then I'm just going to back up a page to the Google search results and go to the second result. Sure. And if that's more interesting and engaging, then I'm going to stick with that one. Mm -hmm. And that's the rabbit hole I'm going down. I mean, you, you want to position these things fun enough, engaging enough, unbranded enough. So you're not being um, sold. So you don't feel like you're being no, sold something. You're definitely not being so sold. Because you're learning something at this yeah. point. And you don't want to be sold something when you're learning. Yeah. Because then it smells weird. Yeah. And you want your rabbit hole to be the one that prospects go down. Because the further in your rabbit hole that they go, there's just this, I mean, there's something scientific to it, but there's this attachment where all of a sudden, even over time, um, because, I mean, how often do you find that you're educating a prospect, but they're, they could still be two years out from using your product. Like, they need to reach yeah. a certain level of maturity. Yep. Be that resource for them for two years, because guess who the first person they're going to come to when they're ready to commit to lettuce wraps? Um, we've made it longer than three minutes. Um, if you're the person who, from the beginning, was educating them, and, and these things then become their beliefs. Right. Right. And the more that their beliefs are like, I, we've got things from from David, from Blair, from um, Brennan Dunn, Sackis. Uh, Vidyard, that when I read them back, I, I'm like, oh, that's that's exactly how we say that. Yeah. But now I can't even tell if we say <laughs> that because that's how they <clears throat> yeah. said that three years ago when we read it for the first time. But I think it's a, it's a trust thing. Like It is. Yeah. It, yeah. You're building trust. That's yeah. what you need to do. And if you're, if you're constantly selling something, yeah. it's hard to trust that. And, and part of trust is, like, would I trust these people to help me solve my problem? They mm -hmm. can educate me, but, like, is this – is <laughs> for some reason, I immediately flashed on uh, Carol Baskin's videos mm -hmm. from Tiger King. Tiger King? Is that what it was? where she's got this like green sheet behind her and she's like floating on a space background mm -hmm. or like that works for her cause she's crazy and a murderer. But, um, I don't know that I would actually trust lettuce wraps that come from a company that I, I may pin some thoughts for later and go explore and see if anyone else has the same opinions. Yeah. But when I get down to that, like who's going to help me find my solution that isn't bread. Um, I'm probably not going to trust someone who's, and I'm not talking about like low production quality, but like if it's sketchy because it's salesy or if it's sketchy because it's in like, there's like dripping water onto the like inventory shelves behind them in the shot or something yeah. like that. I, I mean, you know, I, I'm trying not to like oversell the, the need for quality, but like that all goes into trust. Mm -hmm. Like, even if it was just on, like, a beige or a white background up against a wall, I'd be like, okay, well, this is clean. As opposed to, like, you know, in a bad weird... Bad green screen. Yeah, bad green yeah. screen or something like that. Um, so those things do go into it. So you're building trust. When you get down to the part where you're starting to introduce your brand for the first time, and and basically you're taking these people on this journey where it's like, we've been talking to you about reasons to and ways to quit bread for a while now. Now feels like the right time in your journey, audience, for us to introduce how we approach an alternative mm -hmm. to bread. And so to me, the bottom of that awareness funnel kind of it ends with that we are this brand, this is our why, these are our differentiators, like these are the benefits. I'm still not really selling you on a product Mm -hmm. But I'm saying take the capital that I've gained by helping educate you and help you understand this space. And now I want to introduce you to our brand because we do have solutions. Uh, typically this funnel, uh, you know, the, the, I guess the modern or we're past the funnel, I think in some stages, people are talking about flywheels, whatever, but yeah, but fine. So that shape is an upside down triangle with the point at the bottom and up at the top, um, there's way more prospects than there are down at the bottom. But we're talking about the content. So does does that triangle is that inverted now? Or like in terms of quantity, I'm talking about like how many of these videos do you need at the top of your funnel? I think my answer is different than when we were outlining this because the addition of that 
unbranded educational content, there could be a ton of that content. Yeah. To be perfectly honest. Um, if I were looking at it from a brand, which I think is how we went into this discussion, thinking about this, is that there are fewer pieces of content at this stage. So if we restrict it to the branded content, mm -hmm. stuff that says, okay, um, let us wrap LLC as a company. Introducing let us wrap. Introducing yeah. let us wrap LLC. Um, those are, those are, you need one video introducing yourself. So you're saying a lot of this like pre-awareness stuff can be a, a, like a library of content, yeah, unbranded or yeah. lightly branded, <clears throat> um, but it's all educational. It's not selling anything, right? And and I and I also firmly believe that the benefit of that is that is to help identify better qualified prospects later on, mm -hmm. because the more educated your <clears throat> potential prospects are the easier it's going to be for them to identify whether once you get into what your solutions are, whether those solutions fit. And we've had a lot of conversations with client re clients recently where it's just as valuable. And, and this is one of those counterintuitive things about marketing and sales, but it, it, it bears out is it's just, just as valuable to disqualify a prospect who's sure. not a fit. Who, who isn't going to be someone who's ultimately going to buy, it's just as valuable to get those people out of the funnel as soon as possible as it is to pass qualified potential actual buyers further down in, in, I always, in the funnel. I always felt like that was theoretical until in the last several <clears throat> springboard or the roadmaps that we've delivered, yeah. we've created content that is specifically about kicking people, unqualified prospects out yes. of the funnel. Yeah. And our clients are eating it up because they know how valuable SDR yeah. time is. They either need to be making more calls or or passing the right people along. Yeah. So still up here at the top of the, the funnel, what sort of metrics are we are we tracking here? What are, oh, well, let, let, something else? Let, let me, let me just, let me just link quality and quantity first before okay. we move on to that. Because, right, with the pre-awareness, with the educational, with the unbranded stuff or lightly branded stuff, depending on what space you're in, that could be a thousand videos. Right. Right. Um, it could be six. Mm -hmm. And that does it enough to help people understand, okay, now I know what my problem yep. is. Um, once you get to that, that branded type of content, the one piece of branded content, content in the awareness stage is that Introducing. brand introduction yep. if you've got a strong brand why like the simon sinek why mm -hmm. that's probably your focus on that messaging if you don't have that but you're in a very crowded marketplace you probably want to lean on your key differentiators um what is it yep. about us that that you know this is how we that this is that that perspective that that position this is how we believe this is done right. And mm -hmm. the people who work best with, best with us are the ones who, who believe the same thing. Yep. Um, that is a hugely important piece of content. It's one piece of content, but it needs to look good. It needs to sound good. It has the largest potential audience of any single piece of content yes. you're going to make. So you have to... And, and yes, likely this is not a first impression, but this is your brand's first impression. Because even the people that you've been educating for years, this is the first time you're saying this is what we're really about. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so this is the, you only get that one chance to make a first impression. So you should be spending more on this video. The, product, the, the production quality needs to be higher on this video. It needs to be the most polished, or like future or ideal version of yourself as possible without being inauthentic. Mm -hmm. um, because it's where you really get to say, come inside. Mm -hmm. Yep. Like like all the other stuff is- It's your front is, door. It's finally your front door. Yes, and all the other stuff <clears throat> is curb appeal, right? And it's, it's the right listing and it's the right tags in the MLS listing or whatever. But like this is the come inside. Yep. This is the front door to say, let's, you know, let's- have coffee together and talk about shit. Mm -hmm. And yeah, for everyone's front door is different and hopefully it reflects some of your beliefs. Some some people might have a lot of windows because they like the the daylight and, and they like transparency. Mm -hmm. so you might have a mezizah, is that what they're called? 
to say, yeah. here's what I identify with. Here's what's something that's important to me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you might have a wreath with a, that has sort of like, or a pineapple to emphasize hospitality. You know, or all swinging. these things. <laughs> Is that what? <laughs> I thought a red light or something. Well, like, then you get into the, the drug a, underworld. It's a, a totally <laughs> different podcast. <clears throat> um, that's a different kind of rap. The, the Swingers Reformation podcast. <laughs> Um, yes, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and also everybody's house is different in, on the inside, too. Yeah. Um, some have finished countertops and some don't. <laughs> some have been waiting for a, a, quite a long time. Um, yes. So, so, before, so before jumping into those metrics, I wanted to, like, this is the, the most polished version of, you, of yourself that you can put out there, mm-hmm. basically, which likely costs more than any other single piece of content you're mm-hmm. going to make. It may not be larger than any other investment in other parts of the funnel, because as we'll get to, there's a larger quantity of that content. But in terms of per video cost, this one I think is most likely top of the food chain. Yeah. Um, so then uh, connecting the, the amount of money you put into it, what are we expecting to get out of this? What sort of metrics are we tracking? and what sort of ROI can we expect from something at this point? The general rule of thumb, not to give away the rest of the episode, is the closer we get to the sale, the easier it is to to track ROI, and the more valuable the metrics that you should be tracking are to selling things. Mm-hmm. So at this stage, because it's the stage that by definition is furthest away from the sale, um, from a metric standpoint, we're able to to consider some of those what we call vanity metrics, mm-hmm. right? Engagement. How much of this video are people watching? We've put a lot of effort and a lot of money into this to look as good as possible. Is this connecting? Mm-hmm. Or are people dropping off at a certain point? Yep. Is that a messaging problem? Is it because we ran out of energy during the edit and 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 the last third is not as good as the first two third i, I mm-hmm. mean there could be all kinds of reasons um and then what kind of reach does it have if this is your opening the door to people um you want this to have a higher view rate likely, mm-hmm. than any of your other individual pieces of content mm-hmm. because this is where people really get into uh, understanding what it is that you can't sell them which let's not forget this is what we're trying to do here mm-hmm. we're trying to sell people things mm-hmm. Uh, views, engagement, and then if we wanted to start to get into some value-based metrics, I'd say that uh, click-through rate. Is this message connecting to the point where people then want to fill in the blank? Sure, fill out a form. Fill out a form or, you know, uh, go to the next piece of content you want them to consume Mm -hmm. or visit. I mean, whatever that that primary CTA is, um, is it getting some kind of action or are people just kind of consuming it and saying, oh, that's nice and yeah. moving on? Yeah, um, And so from an ROI standpoint, I, I, it's, it's hard to... It's hard to connect from, from all of those people it's who... It's the hardest piece, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of people who are not going to end up buying. Yep. And it's hard to draw a straight line from yep. there to, to a purchase. And that's fine. But if, if you're on a basic level if you're if you're identifying more uh further downstream if your your numbers are going up that probably means that this top level content is working sure so you may even have to just look at the overall metrics from your downstream content and if those have an increase it then it's circumstantial, but it implies it validates, that there are yeah. more people coming into that funnel. Yep. And and like you talked to before, um, working with clients now on on that qualification piece, some of some of the argument is is you've got a really bad process, or you're getting a lot of unqualified prospects going to demo or Mm -hmm. raising their hand or submitting themselves as a leader, whatever it is based on the company, God forbid we do a really good job of increasing people in the funnel because then that's just going to create a log jam because the bottom part of your funnel is messed up anyway and is a sieve and, you know, the right people aren't going to get through. So God forbid we do our job right, you know, higher up in the funnel 
and the bottom part of the funnel can't handle it Falls because apart. it's it's mismanaged or not disqualifying or yeah. whatever all of those things are. So, yeah, if you, all of a sudden you see an increase in that kind of stuff, it's likely that you're doing a good job getting people into mm-hmm. that whole pipeline. I'd like to hear from our sponsor. Some of our sponsors have really, really quality copy that they send through. Oh, yeah. Others don't because maybe they were less prepared when they when they signed up. Uh-huh. Uh, this the Whipper Capper, uh, and so you were part of this experiment last night. So what they did is they sent us their product. Yes. Um, and you, you may have noticed Parker. We were, so we were at the baseball game last night. We were. Durham Bulls. Go Bulls. They won yep. something to something. And uh, Parker, you saw him wearing the hat. Uh-huh. Well. Um, Parker being your three-year-old son. Yep. Yep. So before we went to the game, we put the whipper capper inside of his head. It fits into all different sizes. It's adjustable just like hats are. As I was saying before we even started the podcast, I was like, man, I barely got to see you guys because I thought that the kids were going to be misbehaving and Jen was going to have to take them home and I'd be able to hang out and and whatever. They were remarkably well-behaved, weren't they? They were. Um, is, and, that, is that because of? The whipper capper. So uh, there's the Whipper Capper and then the Whipper Capper uh, Deluxe. We had the Deluxe, which I think is is great, um, but it's a step up. So the Whipper Capper by itself, um, it's simply – so it's in the hat. If, if a child is misbehaving, it starts to pull their ear like, a, you know, like your grandma used to do if, mm-hmm. you, were, if you were misbehaving. Um, the Whipper Capper Deluxe, it, it – it, has a variety of punishments. So sure. it it does the you know it pulls, but it also flicks. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it does the wet willy. Right. And then um, there's a, uh, a a function you have to turn the dial up a little bit, but it'll actually like kind of smack the back of the kid's head. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just to get some variety so that you can kind of level up. Like, hey, I said stop it, but now, you, you, but you don't have to act that way as an adult anymore. You can just let the cap do its job. Right. And this is all driven by AI. Right. 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 Yeah, and so it's actually connecting to certain spots. It's a, it's like a neural link. It's a neural, yeah, yeah it's a neural yeah. link kind of thing. So it doesn't actually like pull their ear. It just creates a sensation in their brain that Correct. makes them feel like they're ears. Yeah, and you, yeah. you kind of, yeah. Yeah, which is seen. amazing for thirty four ninety five. For, yeah. for the deluxe <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, it, yeah, it's kind of in a testing mode right now. It's not available for, for sale yet. Any side effects that you noticed? Uh, they slept really late this morning. Okay. Uh, and we couldn't get his hat off, so I don't know. <laughs> Without a bleeding. I, yeah. Uh, yeah. But like you said, beta mode. Beta. So yeah, so, yeah I mean, look for those to to be released around, right before Christmas time, the holidays. Sure. Um, uh-huh. But, but yeah, it was a phenomenal experience. Um, I just – I wish I could have spent more time with, with you guys. Yeah. No. That's, I was um, enjoying my time with my children, which – I know. Was, that's weird. Yeah. Well – uh, we're excited to have the whipper capper on board. Should we jump back into the funnel here? Yeah. Let's not go into the deep end yet. Let's stay kind of in the middle, all right? So we're uh, – what's happening at this stage of the funnel? We've been – we've identified that a problem exists and that we have that problem. We've found a, a brand that may have a solution for me. Yes. Now what's happening? As a brand – we start to ex- we start to explain our solution. Mm-hmm. Um, as an audience, we want to understand what solutions this brand provides to our problems or our problem, the options that there are, what kind of features, what what kind of you know, which of my pain points is it going to help me solve? Which of my problems is it going to address? Yeah. And what are the like, you know, what are these different products? How do they work together? Are they things that work together? Or do I need you know those kinds of mm-hmm. of things? Is this something that I could see really being a solution? Because then at that point, I want to weigh it against some other options, and that's where we're in kind of that bottom stage. Yeah, this is all from this point on. It's all branded. Sure, um, it still may not be hugely salesy, but at the very least, we're saying that Let Us Wrap LLC has a bib Let Us Wrap. Mm. And a romaine. a romaine lettuce wrap and an iceberg lettuce wrap and romaine's probably for like the long sausage shaped things, you know. Yeah. Um yeah, just given its its shape and yep. its sturdiness. And, and you the, can put a lot of toppings on it. A bib lettuce replaces a bagel, of course. Yeah. 
but yes, that's exactly it. Like, what might you use the romaine for? Uh huh. Okay, your sausages, your hot dogs. I mean, this is absolutely absurd, but it kind of <laughs> works. Um, right, and and so you want if we expand this into the real B two B space, um, you want people to be able to understand. Okay, there's this product, this product, and this product. This is something that I am responsible for, or that I need help with, or that I need to be managing. Um, so is this, and so is this. On each of those silos, now I need to understand, okay, well, does it integrate with Marketo? Sure. Does it provide reporting? Um, does it do the things that I currently use bread for, mm -hmm. right? Outside of just hot dog buns, bagels, and, and sandwiches, all the other things that I use bread for, like charcuterie plates and French toast, French toast and whatever. Um, can it do those things or is there just a, a set group of things that it does really yeah. well? And to get to a point to either be able to say, I think this is something I want to consider trying or you know what? I know I need to get away from bread and they've really helped me understand what, why I should and validate the idea to get away from bread. But I don't think lettuce is the way to go. Yep. And that's fine. Yeah. Because then they're not going to be someone saying, yes, please give me a lettuce demo. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. and your sales rep is going to waste time doing an hour long demo to someone who already kind of feels like, well, lettuce isn't the right solution. Yeah. We, we do, we do work a bit to death, don't we? <laughs> Traditionally, we work a bit to death. Um, so yeah, that's what that's what we're trying to do at this stage. So you're evaluating if this product in particular is right. You're not you're not comparing anything yet. You're just right. And is then, this a potential either solution to a problem I have or replacement for a solution that I already have that's going to be better, cheaper, faster, yeah. whatever? So um, does the let's talk about the production quality here. Does it need to be of a certain level? Or where would you suggest it be? I would say that it doesn't need to be the level of the in brand intro video because it's not the front door, but we're standing in the foyer and we can see the directions we can go. Mm -hmm. To mix metaphors, um, we can see that the formal parlor is over here, the dining room is over here, the kitchen and and the living area are off on the back of the house. We can also see that there's an upstairs. And we see that there's got to be at least three bedrooms up there. I see a bathroom. Like, I, I can see. And so I've got my options to kind of explore each mm -hmm. space. And if there's, like, piles of dirty laundry or, you know, there's cobwebs in, in on the baseboards and there's, like, kids' toys all around Garbage, or yeah. whatever, like... Okay, that's probably not something I want to do a whole lot of exploring on. Yeah. So it does need to. It doesn't have to be like perfect architectural detail, but what you've got, make it clean. Yeah. Yeah. Make it inviting. Yeah. Very good. So in terms of quantity, you're de like you like you said uh, up at the top of this funnel. I've got a front door that I'm all. I'm only focused yeah. on the front door. Now I see that I've got some options, and uh, and so you've got to. I think you've got to address certain points, but you don't have to go into like extreme detail on everything. Right. And so they should be, they should be short. They should be pointed and in, inform, informative, but, um, but not like, not super long. I should be able to kind of choose my own, my own journey here mm -hmm. and see and, and test some stuff out. In terms of the old sales language, you've got features and benefits, mm -hmm. right? So if our higher up in the funnel stuff is, 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 again, since we're not getting to a solution, we can't be talking about any features, that, that front door is these are the benefits you get from working with us, from partnering yep. with us, from buying one of our products, whatever it may be. These are the benefits of coming into this house. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we're standing in the foyer, we can at least take a step over into the threshold of each of these other rooms. Mm -hmm. We can peek our head in and say, oh, that fireplace makes this room cozy. Mm -hmm. So that feature, the fireplace, gives me the benefit of a cozy space. Yep. So now I can see that this product is what starts to potentially address the issue I had of 
not having a cozy space to have hot chocolate yep. and you know cuddle up with the kids before bedtime yep. kind of thing. The next stage is then going in and actually like sitting on the couch mm -hmm. or turning Testing on the fire and seeing yeah, how yeah. much heat is it putting yes, out, right? Yes. But we're standing in the threshold, we're looking in that one space and we're saying, okay, I like this room. Yep. And then we're going to another room and saying, oh, that is, there's some great natural light coming in, in here, which makes it just a great energy for a dining room. Uh -huh. This is a place where I would love to host friends for a medium formal dinner around the table with no kids. And, and I'm the kind of person who enjoys social interaction, so I feel like this is gonna be good for me. Yeah, so so that's where we are. We, we've got, you know, we've gone from one piece of content that is about the multiple benefits to individual pieces of content that are saying either these are my products and the features and benefits of them in each, or potentially, this is my product, and then a sub series that focuses on features on some of those more specific features. And so you could do a 90 second piece on um, the parlor and talk about how the fireplace makes it cozy, the um, you know, the coffered ceiling makes it uh, luxurious, and the built in bookcases make it, you know, educational, uh, yeah, <laughs> educational. <laughs> Um, entertaining and then theoretically you could have then three videos below that that spend more time talking about this gas fireplace was manufactured by so-and-so built in this and, era. yes and it puts out this many btus which if it's 73 degrees in the room it will heat up the room by one degree every hour uh, yeah you know those kinds of um, but you're also probably putting that with some imagery that's, you know, a family sitting around the fire, drinking mm -hmm. the hot cocoa, things like that. So you've got a couple opportunities there depending on what it is you're actually selling to, to drive down and how important your audience f uh, feels it is to assess each of the individual features. And also, how much do they break out? Are we buying yeah. an entire suite of things? Or are these a la carte pieces that yeah. we can pick and choose from? Yeah. If they're a la carte, you need to take that extra step and justify buying those a la carte features, even if it's just aspirational. Mm -hmm. Like you don't have any kids yet, but you're planning on kids and you'd really like to have a space where you can all cuddle around the fire in the winter. So we've got more content. It's more educational. It's But it's still a look, don't touch kind of thing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and and it, yeah, there's some aspiration. There's some there's you're starting to get. I don't want to say salesy, but more specific to this individual and what they they might need. Your, yes. your buyer might need. Yes, and you're you're letting them imagine themselves use this. Yeah, you're letting them start to take mental ownership. Which, from a sales standpoint, that's what like that's what you want. You yep. want somebody. You want you're listening for those buying words. You know, oh, I could see us doing this with it. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. They're starting to like emotionally. Oh, our table would look good in this. here. Yes. What sort of metrics do we want to be looking at at, at this point if we're, if we're evaluating the efficacy of these videos? Um, at at this point, you basically want someone to raise their hand and say, "I'm eligible for this. I I should either talk to somebody or I want to find out about pricing." It, yeah. It's, I think the key and, and what a lot of companies could do better is is giving prospects at this stage more than one opportunity. And I want to be careful here because I don't want to go against giving someone a specific action to take after consuming a video. But I want to figure out what my second call to action is. And so there are the people who are going to reach that threshold through some of this content where they say, I am ready for a demo. Mm -hmm. I am ready to talk to a salesperson. I am ready to see what this is going to cost. Like, this is a solution that I have identified will help us. Mm -hmm. The next thing I need to know is, can we afford it? Right. Largely. What? How long of a commitment is this? Yeah. Um, and you don't want to take that opportunity away from people. You don't want right. to lead too heavily to this 85% of people who self-educate before saying, I want to talk to sales. But if that is your secondary call to action, you're not going to miss out on those opportunities for the, the earlier adopters to say, I'm ready. Or the people who you've already given them enough information to say, yes, I want a demo. You don't want to make it hard to do that. Right. 
Um, but then you still want to give the people who need more information, need to do more research, need more social proof, need to kick the tires more, need to go into that next level of the funnel while they're still self-educating. You need to drive them to that next option. Yep. So it's it's either um, like still not convinced. Mm-hmm. Check out our X Y Z video, or uh, you yep. know that could be something that we'd get into in, in the bottom part of the yeah. funnel here. So you want to either drive them through that funnel or get them to go out and do the thing you want them to do, which is say, I'm ready for a demo. And because of that, you are able as a marketer to say, to draw a direct line to the ROI. Yes. If you started to create j- uh, revenue from that video well, when somebody says, I want to buy. Yeah, and if somebody says um, either – they click a link to go consume um, the next series of videos that are more technically specific, so that we'll get to in the bottom of the funnel stuff. Uh, maybe what you do is you actually put a basic lead gate in their way. It's like a private library, but what they have to do is type in their name and email address in the video player, and then they get taken to a private link that has that bottom of funnel content. Mm -hmm. So you're capturing them as a lead, and now you can say, hey, on this video, this is where we first had this person identify themselves as somebody who was willing to give us some information to get more information from us. You might even use uh, a drop-down of some sort of radio buttons that say, I want more information about price, um, quality, and and where it it is on a friggin' Gartner chart or something, you know. Yeah, Alternatively... Um, if you're using something like Marketo, you can actually do advanced lead gating so that if somebody has already been identified by Marketo because they've already put in their information, yep. you can trigger a different form. So you, so if somebody higher up um, downloaded higher up in the funnel downloaded a white paper mm-hmm. and they put in their name and their email address to do that, it sets that Marketo cookie. Um, you could get to that that same video player, and at the end, the call to action, because you already have their name and email, it could be those more specific things. You're gathering more information about them at that point. Um, or it could be triggered that if they aren't a Marketo identified lead, this yeah. is where now for the first time they yep. put in. So you can start to see whether an individual piece of content is something that was on the journey mm-hmm. or something where they first said, I'm willing because there is I think we gloss over lead capture so much, but there is a psychological aspect. Uh, There's a um, there's a reciprocity with a lead gen form. You have to make it compelling enough for someone to give up another means to access them. Yeah. And and I like it when it's like a name and email because then it ends up in my inbox and I can unsubscribe or I can save it for later or whatever. I hate having to put in my phone number because mm-hmm. I don't want anybody to call me mm-hmm. unless I have an option to go in and say, I'm ready for a demo and here's the number you can call me on mm-hmm. to give me that demo. Um, but yeah. I, so to answer your original question, we're talking about tracking leads captured. We're talking about um, conversion rates with those forms on those pieces of content. Um, And we're even potentially looking into how viewing this content adds to lead scoring if it is someone who's already identified as a lead and you're using an advanced platform to to score leads. Yeah, because then at some point if they put their information in, then you can backtrack and see what other videos they have watched and you can start to draw more direct lines of... And so you start to see which path a lot of people are going on this Plinko game. Yep. And then the one thing, uh, again, to ROI, you can also see if there are people who just decided to buy from that video. Yeah. Yep. Well, and that's the thing, too, is we've been talking about a demo, but uh, a lot of companies set it up so that it's, um, so, excuse me, sign up for a free trial. Yeah. Yeah. Another way to go. And and sign up for a free trial skips a salesperson almost altogether. I mean, usually there's like at least an SDR that follows up once someone has signed yeah. up for a free trial. But like that's the ultimate way to get them in because then if you've got a mechanism where you can confidently convert people from a trial to a paid subscription, 
then you've done it without a demo. And mm-hmm. that is the model for a lot of a lot of lettuce wrap companies, as I understand it. And at, at that point, they get ser- once they've downloaded a free trial. At that point, you're serving them different content, edu- like um, yes. uh, onboarding type content. Yeah. To get to to get that traction and stickiness of the product, which to me would qualify as outside the scope of Correct. this funnel, Correct. because it's it's a different it's a conversion of a different sort. Yes, yeah, it's a whole different episode. Let's talk a little bit about the bottom of the funnel for people who need the bottom of the funnel still to convince them to to buy something. Yep. Um, if we've gone from from benefits to features and benefits. This is where we're down to just the features. Very much so, yeah. This is this is the kick the tires test drive level. This is um, this is the walk into the parlor and sit on the chaise lounge and soak in nap. the room, yeah. <laughs> take a nap, smell those fresh baked cookies. Uh, I mean, it's it's that really trying it out. And to be perfectly honest, I don't know why more people can't spend the night in the house before they buy it. I know, um, but. Um, but we're not real estate experts, so um, uh, residential yeah, th- at least. Th- this is right. This is where um, this is where you show people like the users, which may not even be the buyers, right? I mean, sure. there may be like a, a, a C suite level person or a VP level person who's making this buying decision and has been going through this process. They may not be the ones who day to day are going to manage the platform. Yeah, they'll send the individual contributor over and say, "Hey, hey you're going to do this demo." Uh, yes, go go check this out. See if this works with because you do this in and out every day. I understand what the workflow is supposed to be, but but is this going to work for you? Yep. Um, and so it it really is. This stuff is is it's there's more of it because it's super specific. It's like how to do a specific task uh-huh. within. A specific feature within a product within the brand so I mean we're just getting more and more granular which means that the quantity of content here is probably much larger yeah right we could be talking about 30 videos we could be talking about industry specific ways to do certain things within the same module yep and in various forms of, of convincing at this point do you want testimonials case studies yeah. demos actual like back end introductions yeah. tests i mean yeah. i mean we we we've got a client right now where we're looking at making a series of we're turning some quick start documentation in for developers to actually insert the code from their api into their like development software to see what it's going to look like to interact with like a test batch of data so are they what after they watch this video and they say Oh, I do want to try that code. Is there like a form or something where they'd be able to download that code? Or is that um, accessible already? I don't know yet, but I imagine the video is very much like works along with a document. Yeah. Like a code pen or a GitHub thing where yep. they can actually copy the 34 lines of yep. code and put them into wherever it applies in their software. So they'd kind of be going along at the so same again, time. Another, another opportunity to gather more information or more, bring more people into the buying process because a yes. lot of times these B two B decisions are based on buying committees and not just a singular person. So yeah. the more, or, I could even see this is an, a, a real world use case, but I could see if you know that that's going to be a user who's watching it who has some influence over the buying decision but doesn't make the buying decision. I could see setting up a custom action at the end of that video, asking them for their feedback. So that the salesperson is actually getting the feedback from mm. the user to then pass on to the buyer yeah. to say, hey, your developer um, filled out the form at the end of this video saying that the test was a success. They rated the ease of use 8 out of 10 at whatever and whatever. So you don't even have to rely on that developer going back to the buyer and saying, yeah, yeah I liked it. It's cool. Yeah. So, I mean, that could be tremendously valuable for that salesperson to have yeah. that information and control how it's... Um, shared with the buyer. So you, you mentioned getting more and more granular, granular, either by the feature itself, or by the industry that they're in, or even by the position of the person yep. in the buying committee. Yep. And it could be so. It could be <laughs> layer upon layer of that. You, that's why you might have eighty videos yes. here. Yes. Absolutely. But they're short. They're specific. They're actionable. 
and they They're can fa- be much scrappier. Yep. They can so, be just personalized videos. Yes. Yep. It could be somebody starting a Vidyard Chrome extension video with a screen share walking through how to do it and their face is in the corner and they're just walking through the, yep. I mean it could be which I mean effectively speaking has no cost to make because you're yep. already that's already it's part of somebody's job right? it's just it's a salesperson yeah. basically making a one off video yep or a developer making a that's, a yeah. video on their own computer without having to edit yeah. anything that could be then pushed out to anyone in this use case yep you know that we, yeah. that that hits these parameters or whatever, and so of course if if we continue on, I mean the the metrics and the ROI one especially for anybody using the last interaction model of of attribution, these are likely the last interactions yeah. before a sale, yep. so it's it's in the last interaction model a hundred percent of the attribution goes to the last piece of content consumed prior to the sale, which would likely be these, which means great have those so that. You can say that hundred thousand dollar deal came from that fifty cent yeah. uh, screen grab video that Joey did, mm-hmm. uh, you know, over in over in sales engineering or whatever. Yep. And we're really talking about, I mean, even further down. This is it's unlikely that someone hasn't identified themselves as a lead by this point, but we could be talking about just somebody new on that buying committee sure it could be some it's pr- likely something that has a lot more control over how it's sent to the viewer so it could mm-hmm. be the kind of thing that isn't necessarily in a library or right. like we talked about a couple minutes ago it's in a non-public library that hub. they have to give yeah. yeah it's some kind of gated hub where they have to give up some kind of information but you can connect a different contact to the same company which connects it to the lead and so even if the, per- the, the individual that you've been working with throughout this process or educating throughout this process doesn't have to be the individual who consumes this, yet you can still tie it all together to know that it fits into this one sale. Yeah. Well, I we made it through. We kind of lost track of our lettuce product, but we got more and more specific about the B2B buying process yeah, and less we, about lettuce. We got a home buying metaphor in there. We, mm-hmm. got, we got giving up bread and going to lettuce wraps. We and started we talked, a new company, I think. And we, and we talked a little bit about... Um, you registered the LLC, right? Okay. We got a little bit about B2B in here, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and video. Yeah. And, and we did talk about and, video the whole time, yeah. I think, so that was good. And, you know, like I said during the pee break that I'm sure got edited out, um, this is one of those that I wasn't sure how we were going to get to 20 or 25 minutes, and we spent 40 minutes on the first bullet point. So. Yeah. Uh, we're back, baby. <laughs> um, shall we hear one more time from our sponsor? Yeah, just for those who uh, may have fast forwarded um, <laughs> the the last sponsor break, uh, Whipper Capper is this fantastic uh, beta version model at the moment. Um, uh, just email me if you'd like uh, a trial version of this. I can get you in touch with uh, with Whipper Cappers. But it's a device. It's a neurological device that fits inside a child's cap. Uh, that helps them behave better through uh, negative reinforcement. And uh, there you go. What could go wrong? Yeah. Um, great. I feel like we already just did our recap. Um, so. Oh, outro banter then. Oh yeah, I should probably put outro and then banter. So thank you for watching <laughs> or listening to this episode of the Video Reformation Podcast. Like, subscribe, download. You know what? Let's throw a new one in there. Um, Go ahead and share the podcast on your favorite social channels. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have a relatively consistent set of subscribers um, that is pretty much constant month over month. But we'd love uh, we love for those of put you a, who constantly download and and presumably listen to uh, share it with some I'd people. Put a, I'd put a link of this exact episode sure. in your Tinder profile if if definitely if I were you. My entire. And if you're bu- already married or whatever, I would just go get Tinder and put this Absolutely. on the profile. Yeah, my entire Bumble profile, uh, I just update new episodes mm-hmm. every two weeks. Is uh, it, do you do and, it with both of our pictures and, in it then? Uh, I, no, I, I just take that camera uh-huh. um, and edit out all the stuff where you're talking. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know why That's Bumble why it takes isn't so long working for, the- for me. <laughs> Outro banter. Yeah, I felt like we got through that already. Yeah, I'm sure it's uh, 
I'm sure it's faded it's out by now. Wow. Good job.